What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to another episode of the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and it feels good to be back here in the office. Hey, we got a great show for you guys. Of course, we're going to hit a fishing report and have a good main interview. And they're all going to have the same topic this week. We're going to be talking about the south end of Lake Michigan, right at home for me, you know, a little bit of Indiana, a little bit of Illinois, maybe even touching Michigan, but it's going to be a good show. So stay tuned for that. But as always, we're going to start right in the news. And I don't have any official reports to give you on new records this week. We had some saltwater records, you know, but we'll pass that for this week. Um, We'll start with some events that happened right here in the Midwest in our backyard here at Midwest Outdoors. Up at the Northbrook uh, Sportsman's Club, they had the Sporting Clay U.S. Open Championship last week. And it was a big event. People came from all over the country. And I have to say... I was able to walk the grounds just after the event, and the Northbrook Sportsman's Club is a gun club unlike any other you've ever seen. Over 800 acres of different shooting locations and spots set up. It is, it is something to see. So if you're a big sporting clay shooter, skeet or trap shooter, highly recommend going to check it out. But like I said, they had the US Open there, and Anthony Matrice, won the overall high. So that means he's the champ. So he goes home with some hardware and $10,000. So hey, congrats to that. We had some other winners that we got to talk about. It was the high school and junior national bass master championship this past week. And we'll start with the juniors. Um, Coming in with a two-day total, we have William Collins and Kyler Jenkins that had five fish for 20 pounds, nine ounces. Um, The limit was three fish, right? So that proves that you don't always have to catch your full limit as long as you have bigger fish than the rest. Um, So they weighed in two days, five out of six fish, right? And they edged out the second place competition by about five ounces there. So, hey, congrats to you guys. I hope that steamrolls into your high school career. As for the high schoolers, um, this really, this event really took my attention because Rex Regan and Max Moody, they won. Um, They were your day two leaders and they took care of business on day three to win uh, with 43 pounds and three ounces out of Pickett County High School. Now, the crazy thing about that is they're sitting past 100th place after day one with only six pounds and three ounces. But then on day two, they came in with one of the biggest high school three fish bags ever with 21 pounds and five ounces. So a little bit of a different day from day one to day two, and I'm sure they loved that. So guys, congrats. The summer break is over. Everyone is home from ICAST, back to their fishing world, and the Northern Swing, as it's called this year, really the New York Swing, is about to start with all the pros. So the MLF have just kicked off underway yesterday, and they are on the St. Lawrence River. Always an absolute phenomenal fishery. Um, If you're a smallmouth guru like a lot of us here in the Midwest, you need to watch this event because it's it's always fun watching on the St. Lawrence. Um, Day one leader yesterday already had over 120 pounds of the MLF scoring, right? Every fish counts. Still pretty impressive to catch 120 pounds of bass in one day. Um, day two is on the way right now, and let's see. Our yep, our buddy Drew Gill is sitting in first, being chased by you know who, Jacob Wheeler. Um, and the Bassmasters also have an event, the Elite Series, that will be starting this week on Lake Champlain. So another iconic New York fishery. The last event we have to cover. Maybe not a national event, but so big to the Chicagoland and South Shore region, and that is the South Shore Bass Open. And our main guest today, Ryan Whitaker, is going to join us. He might not won. He might have been my pick, but he had an unbelievable finish, and he, he is known as one of the hammers on the big lake in our area. And he spent years out there perfecting a bait he's made, and we'll talk about that more, and now guiding out there. So really when it comes to the South Shore 
of Lake Michigan. Ryan Whitaker is a name, so please stay tuned for that. But the South Shore Bass event did happen, and we have a winner. Clint Marler and Phil Durack. Congrats, guys, with 28 pounds, 28.3. Okay, that's not ounces, so 28.3. And he edged out our friend Ryan by 0.18. So very tight tournament. Um, when it comes to tournaments, it all comes down to ounces. Um, you know, this was an event that was going to be won on all accounts on large smallmouth in deeper Lake Michigan water. Um, we went around and surveyed a bunch of people, and we'll talk more about that with Ryan on what they thought the weights were going to be. But it was a lot lighter than everyone thought. The fishing was tougher, but it was a great event. Almost 40 teams competed. Um, some of the locals, families, and friends came out for the weigh-in, so look forward to talk more about that. But we, of course, have to give credit where it's due to our winners, so congrats, guys. But hey, we're going to take a quick commercial break, then we're going to be right back with a fishing report from the Midwest. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. everyone here we are joined by johnny wilkins um you know the man behind the chicago fishing school uh fishing guide fishing extraordinaire has attempted uh some world records i believe um and just likes to catch them small or big that's johnny wilkins everyone how you doing johnny yeah all right hello everyone there we we want to do a uh, we would not do want to do a world record this month so no, no, the fishing's the fishing's been tough overall, you know. Oh man, yeah. So we're dealing with a lot, but uh, if you put in the time, you'll get rewarded. That's about the way it goes. Yeah. So tell me, what's what's popping off right now on the uh, south side of Chicago, Northwest Indiana? I know you're, you know, been out fishing a lot with the youth of America. Um, and I know you've been hitting some forest preserve lakes, you know, some local reservoirs and ponds and stuff. What do you what do you got for us? Yeah, been doing a lot of youth youth's work, uh, a lot of tangles. But uh, I've been on the water a lot, so I've seen some patterns and and uh, seen a lot that we have to deal with. So uh, the weather's been up and down, a lot of fronts, a lot of hot, really hot water, warm water temperatures, and then. Uh, some of the lakes you're going to be dealing with algae blooms on top of the warm water. So the conditions are pretty tough. Um, and to get around that, you you have to use a lot of movement, uh, a lot of short movement. So unlike other times of year, when if you get dark stained algae water that's hot, it's a tough bite. That, that's a light bite condition. So uh, I think I think what gets you past that are short really short movements whatever you're fishing it's got to be short twitch you you got to put some sound and motion out there but keep the bait whatever you're fishing live bait lures uh plastics ned regs have been working really well for bass but uh where the everyone is scoring is with short twitches and keep that bait where they can see it otherwise it just disappears and they're not going to chase this time of year so when it comes to um, the panfish, you know, I, I know you know a few things about a bluegill or so. Um, it might be a little harder to catch some of them crappie in the shallower, you know, ponds and lakes around here this time of year. But 
The bluegill, the, they seem to be uh, one of the more consistent fish when it comes to the hot weather. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bluegill are pretty interesting. The crappie will uh, kind of spread out, so there's not really a good pattern this time of year, but you will find them off structure, suspended, and hanging off. But the bluegills are pretty neat because they kind of go in a couple different patterns at the same time. So you'll find them suspended, but then they also find uh, bigger gills working the bottom. They'll be working flats and uh, probably eating, uh, you know, small worms and uh, like blood fl- uh, blood worms. Yeah, that's probably a primary this time is. So they're picking down on the bottom. So you'll find them hugging the bottom, especially when we go hot, cold, when you have cold front and hot front, mm-hmm. that bottom is a consistent, like it's a steady temperature. So that, that's one pattern you can go to this time of year is uh, keep it three three to five inches off the bottom. And then you'll also find a stack of bluegills that are uh, like a foot and a half, two feet off the bottom. Okay. So that's it's nice this time of year because they, they'll cooperate and again, at same short twitch motions. Uh, I'll probably go to a little bit bigger, uh, brighter bait, whether it's uh, artificial or if you're fishing grubs and worms, it's short twitch. Get some get some motion on it so that they can locate it, and then let it sit because they are sight feeders. Even if it's like a, a pea green soup uh, water. You still want this. They still want to get up next to it and take a look. I have to ask you something. I've been waiting to talk to you and I wanted to get you on um, earlier in the month, maybe even last month, because now it's about over. But it seems like the August, the annual ones are coming back was here in Chicago. We had the cicada bloom, the infestation of the cicadas. And I was like, you know, not too many people can relate to it because it's right here in Chicago. You know, we get more than anyone else in the country. So it's like, did you see the effects of fishing a little different during that time? Uh, definitely, definitely different. So uh, there were two things I was looking forward to. And that was, uh, oh, we had a big eclipse. And then it, when you get these type of natural events, it's kind of cool to be doing anything. So uh, I was umpiring behind the plate in the eclipse. That wasn't as cool as the cicadas. Yeah. But when time you get these kind of natural events, it's really neat to be out there because uh, the water did change. And sometimes it's not for the better. So if you get a massive hatch of mayflies, or in this case, this giant brood of alien giant insects, uh, it wasn't for the better because it really kind of made fishing weird. And I definitely didn't take advantage. So at one point, I would fish and then go to the trees and then go get bait. And then I I was surface fishing uh, cicadas. And at one point, it was pretty hot action. I don't know if you you did anything like that surface-wise, but the fish definitely came up and some of them were heavy feeding on cicadas. So did you you try? Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned it, you know, for... 30 seconds in a earlier show. Um, yeah. But there was two, there was two things I did. We had one, um, you know, our title sponsor fish daddy. We, I was experimenting with some new ice fishing baits that we're actually going to come out with this year. And um, one is very buoyant. So it floats well. And it's um, it's, it's about a profile this big, you know, about an inch or so. And with a super fine wire light hook, I was able to skirt it across the surface, like a water bug kind of, and they were eating the heck out of that. And then anytime I could get a two inch, you know, one and a half to two and a half inch hopper next to any like mulberry bush or any large size bush that hung by the water. I mean, it was lights out. There were giant crappie bass bluegill that were all sitting there and it was, um, yeah, it was pretty cool, you know, to have um, an earlier than normal active top water bite. You know, normally, um, obviously, you can catch them from you know pre spawn on on the surface, but this um, the bite for us got really good in um, you know June there because of them cicadas. These as fast as you could find a cicada and get it rigged up, uh, the 
I found that once they sank, they weren't as effective. So no, they didn't, they didn't stay, on top. Yeah, they didn't stay. And like when I was harvesting them, they, they were done. They were done laying eggs too. So they the the trees that looked like Ghostbusters at the time. It was like just plasma hanging off the trees. So, so they were done dancing at that point. But the fish, the fish were still hitting them. And, and uh, a lot of bass, a lot of bluegill, and you kind of you get a small bluegill that jump on the cicada. They were ripping them apart, apparently. But then you'd be like, oh, it's just a small bluegill. So I was bass, bass, bluegill, bluegill. They were hitting pretty well. And then uh, I had like I had a hard stopping moment. So I had a, a very small float attached, and then about twenty four inches of line is my secret cicada rig. So I'll keep that in, you know. 13 years from now, I'll be ready to go. Yeah, 17 uh, from now, break it up. 17, yeah. So, brood X, X, I, X. So then, uh, I'm I'm getting the bass, and you're like fending off the bluegill, but then uh, all of a sudden, this three, three and a half foot orange koi came up right, right between the float and the cicada and literally took a left turn to the float. And then I don't, the cicada just wasn't moving enough, but my like heart stopped because I three pound line, I was ready to go. And then, and then, then somebody spooked it. So there you go. Not well, too far from uh, Midwest Outdoors headquarters too. So, Hey, there you go. There you go. And like I said, guys, Johnny, Johnny truly does get excited, whether it's a bluegill, a goldfish or a salmon, you know, he'll catch them all. Or submarine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool site. Absolutely. Now, now, Johnny, you know, we, we're going to talk to Ryan Whitaker here in a minute, our, our guest, uh, our featured guest of the show. And we're going to talk a lot about bass, but, um, you know, we have this unbelievable city with unbelievable access to miles and miles and miles of water. Um, you know, Tell the people kind of besides bass fishing and, and, you know, the salmon and trout that come right now, you know, what are some great fishing opportunities just right here in the lakefront of Northwest Indiana and Chicago? Well, I mean, we have so many miles of forest preserve uh, and it's just a matter of picking out good shoreline. Uh, there's some catch and release opportunities. So if you have lakes that are designated catch and release, a lot of times they'll have a uh, quality fish stock so all of your species will be a little bigger and a little uh little uh more freak you know their population of bluegills that are decent size is thicker your population of bass that are going to be you know 16 to 20 inches is a lot better whereas if you go to the public waters you might run into uh, more fish but smaller you're not going to have the opportunities of uh you know bigger big fish, you know, three, four, five pounds that you might have on, on, uh, Northern waters, but there's lots of opportunities. I suggest using, uh, the, the websites of these lakes and then use your Google maps and then use your, I have a Navionics a boating app that gives me all of the U S GA, all of the little depth maps and contours. And that helps you to pick out a shore spot. So you don't even need a boat. You yeah. can fish a lot of structure uh, and you can find fish cribs that you can cast too. And that's, again, that's great crappie tip is finding some structure that you can cast to. Uh, and then great live bait would be I always have some great live bait on the utility belt, because uh, if, if they're just not active, you can make them active. So um, I do, uh, I do fish plastics and, uh, but having some great live bait when the conditions are horrible is a, it's a huge advantage. So, so you, you look at, you do your research at home before you go the night before when, you know, when you're preparing. So the more you prepare at home, the more fish you're going to catch. So if you arrive with your, all your snells, everything hooked up, you're rigged. All you're going to do is take it off the rod and take it out of the, maybe you got a little plastic sleeve on your hooks and that you, you're just all set to go the less time you spend at the edge of the water getting ready and and more oh, fish you can catch man 
You're speaking to me right now, Johnny, and I got to interrupt you because I'm a high school fishing coach and I have been now for going on a decade now, believe it or not, right? And the thing that infuriates me, and I believe this comes from my tournament fishing background, is when we get to the water and the kids are just now putting their line through the eyes and tying their hooks on and I'm like, (laughs) we only have so many years I mean, you know, here in Chicagoland, right, we only have so much time for open water and the seasons is so short for these kids, you know, and it's like we need to make the most casts we can every opportunity we can, because at the end of the day, sometimes that's all it is, is a numbers game. You know, you need to put that bait out in front of a fish as many times as you possibly can to get them to bite. And uh, yes, preparing at home is and not the not the night before either. It's got to be you spread it out. So so spread it out. So you you're watching hard knocks on Tuesday and do a little bit, tie a little bit, and then you're watching murder she wrote on Wednesday in the commercials. You're hitting your tying a little bit so that you don't leave it all to the end because you might find out you need something to go to sleep. But yeah, you don't want to be on the water and you're like tying and looking over and then oh, it's like a school of fish just went by and you're still tying. Well, you missed out you missed out yeah so <laughs> well johnny um yeah. before we let you go here if if someone is in the chicagoland area and um you know has hasn't hasn't um you know gone fishing here much you know they're you're, they're used to going to the lake house in wisconsin or michigan or t- utilizing a guide once a year you know what, what would yeah. you say to an individual you know that that likes to fish but doesn't fish around here a lot Oh, definitely. E- explore the closest pond to your house. You need to fish it. And, and uh, it's like batting cages for baseball. You go hit that local pond because if you only have to drive seven minutes, you'll go fish. If you have to drive 45 minutes to an hour, you'll just put it off. So I would say explore Desplaines River. I I'd hit, <laughs> I mean, Sag Canal. You could go to down anywhere, Chicago River. Illinois River, any any water right next to you, Park District Pond. Uh, some of the biggest fish I've ever caught are in the smallest pond you can imagine. Like, like this, it looks like a little tiny swimming pool with a fountain on it. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And they're in there. These ponds are filled with fish. So, yep. practice yep. on your closest pond and get out there, and maybe fish light too. Lighten it up a bit. <laughs> I see some big stuff out there, man. I, I always joke that people are, what are you going to the ocean? You're surf casting out here. Like so on these, on a light bite, like in this heat, uh, a small hook can catch you a massive fish. So. can go a long way. Finesse the presentation at the heat of summer a little bit. Oh yeah. It's tough. So yeah. yeah. Even up North, uh, a little weird uh, up in the North woods, weird uh, bites and, Patterns are off, so hopefully we'll get back to a good pattern with a, a, a nice hardy winter. But yeah, we need some snow cover and ice to get things back to normal. I think. I agree. I agree. Okay. Well, hey Johnny, if people want to check you out or do want to check out your school or go have a guided trip with you, where can they find your information at? Uh, at Chicago Fishing on uh, the YouTube, I do some step by step. I'm doing more how to tie knots, how to snell hooks, tips for that, and then uh, chicagofishingschool.com. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone, you heard it. That's Johnny Wilkins, and he'll tell you how to finesse, how to float fish, and how to just catch more fish. Johnny, thanks for joining us. Uh, Let's do a little more in the future, all right, about float fishing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Also, if people want to subscribe to the magazine, you guys had some deals going. Do we – we can still get subscribers some of because I always say also read Midwest Outdoors magazine, man. That's that's a no-brainer. It's a great magazine. There's literally up to a hundred pages of just high quality content that you can learn from. Yeah. All right. All right. That's Keep talking to you, man. That's what you had. Hey, no, I appreciate you joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. All right. See you doing. All right. All right, Johnny boy, thanks for that fishing report and all the information on our 
Northwest Indiana and Chicago land bodies of water. Like he said, whether it's the Chicago lakefront or an inland neighborhood pond, there's truly so many fish and fishing opportunities to be had right here in a big city and nearby. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be right back with our main interview, and this is one you're not going to want to miss. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alrighty, everyone. Well, hey, like I promised, here we have Ryan Popcorn Whitaker. Might know him from Stray Casts, might know him from, you know, his infamous jig that lands many brown bass here and around the country. Ryan Whitaker, what's up, Ryan? What's up, Jimmy? How are you? Oh, not too much. Um, you know, in the office, I wish I was on the boat, but I don't know. I, I think I'd rather have my boat on water than in that south side drive yeah it's better to be on water than in the driveway um got a trip tomorrow so kind of getting prepared for it and uh it's just nice to be out here right now because it's not three thousand degrees anymore so it's enjoying been, that in the driveway here it's been a really nice two days so far i hope it continues <laughs> yeah except for you know it's nice but when you get cool weather in the summer in chicago that means gigantic waves on lake michigan most of the time so that does that's why i'm not out today there was you know eight to 12 footers this morning out there so uh we're not going out there you uh, know before we get into the tournament stuff uh, just because you said eight to 12 footers um you know people don't really think about that on a lake right our our great lake is truly more like an ocean or a sea you know but once it calms down and it will how do you address going out and fishing that stirred up water like you know the next day like because we can have those days where it goes from truly six to eight footers to dead calm the next day yeah yeah so yeah it's a good question um the lake does churn up pretty bad you know in the first couple miles of shore you know mile or two uh, of the shoreline because there's so much silt in the south end of lake michigan so yeah um tomorrow's gonna be the water will be a little dirty in the summer. It doesn't seem to last as long. Okay. The dirt for whatever reason, you know, cold weather months, it'll dirty up and last for a while, but um, you're just looking for steady water. Like there, there's protected water that will get cloudier, but it stays a little more visible. It doesn't get, you know, you'll get certain areas where you'll get just like, you see big mud clouds in the water and grass that comes from God knows where floating around everywhere in the middle of the water column makes it hard to fish. But, um, you know, if you get inside some break walls, there's, you know, Chicago Harbor and Cal Park, uh, those areas stay protected enough where the water will be. You'll have enough visibility to catch fish. And uh, that that's what I'm looking for. Harbor mouths, even inside harbors, sometimes fish will slide in there if it gets real muddy. It doesn't matter what time of year. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you just got to find clean water. Just like fishing anywhere in the spring, looking for clear water. Um, but yeah, it's it's tricky. It is tricky. Absolutely. Now, in, in the spring, you know, I look for, I'm a big advocate of looking for that dirtier water, you know, usually blown in um, to a certain cove, you know, or a bay and you find warmer. that because that warm, right, that dirty water warms up faster. Now, smallmouth, I've fished different parts of the country sometimes they get as far the heck away from dirty water as they can other times they do seem to especially in the spring or late fall 
they seem to like that warmed up dirty water and you know maybe you can catch them a little lower in the column where that sediment isn't you know so thick right right yeah i mean right now i'm honestly i'm pretty excited that the water is going to get clouded up a little bit because the last week week and a half the water got so clear yeah that the bite just got super tough and you get like hot water and super clear water it just it gets really tough to get a bite you can find fish but they're they're hard to get to eat but you get a little bit of dinge in the water and cut that visibility down they're not so spooky and you can start getting them on a crankbait and spinnerbait again which is i mean my absolute favorite way to catch them out there yeah. on moving baits I'm, I'm excited to get out there tomorrow and put some people on some fish hey if if uh if your clients could only hear that today you know they'd be happy you know they'd be like all right all right ryan's happy about tomorrow we're looking forward to it um <laughs> yeah yeah before we move on water yeah exactly before we move on to the tournament by the way that dirty water sticks around a little longer in the winter because the molecules in cold water move slower than in warm right. water so everything gets to settle faster in the fast moving molecules a little science professor o'neill yeah. yeah there you have it yeah that's uh i knew that i just didn't want to say it <laughs> right I'm of kidding. course obviously um, all right, so <laughs> the South Shore Bass Open, right? Um, yeah, we've heard about it for almost a year, you know, a little under that, and um, boom, it happened. It, it's I can't believe it's already over. Um, I yeah. I already told you know, there's no shock value. I already told the viewers uh, that I was going into the casino. You know, I, I I was looking on the machine for Ryan Whitaker and the Bass Open. And horseshoe didn't have that as an as a bet that you could make. Um, there was no there was no, <laughs> there was no card on the bass open. We, we got as they shouldn't, as they should. But but, uh, but obviously, um, you know, I think you had some high hopes. You and your partner had some high hopes. Um, which second place, no shame at all. Money in the pocket. Get to fish for two days in a place you love. But um, tell me about the tournament a little bit. What happened? Yeah, the tournament, I mean, uh, just talking about the tournament, I mean, it, it went off awesome. It was, uh, you know, a lot of people put a lot of work into that thing, mainly, you know, especially Dennis Bannock. He put in a solid five, six months of work into this tournament yeah. and more. You know, there was a lot of meetings set up. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a board set up initially to uh, just get, you know, kind of get a grasp on what we wanted it to look like. And, uh, you know, I got away from it quick but you know it was first brought to csba um by a couple anglers as an idea and and we were all super excited about it and to have south shore be involved and then to get horseshoe involved it just just got even more real from the get-go people were very supportive from from day one yeah to have a big event like that here just because they don't happen i mean it's it's been kind of a shame you know there was the big lake shootouts as a little before my time Yep. that ed bone got going he kind of got the ball rolling and then um with csba the 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 big lake division has i mean we've seen a, a pretty good increase in in participation over the last i think four years we've been doing that yep. and uh it just seemed like a no-brainer this was the next step to start building the scene around here and the tournament went great i mean that's the best you know i fished some bassmaster opens um, and those are great events, you know, 250 boats and they, they make them run perfect. But with the logistics being in the Chicagoland area makes it a little tricky. Yeah. And the Horseshoe Casino and Dennis and all his volunteers, they made it go great. We had golf carts taking us with our fish to the, to the holding tanks, um, bringing bags to us. A huge, I mean, that, <laughs> that's what I was telling everybody that leaderboard. I think the only one that big I've ever seen was at the Bassmasters Classic. It was it was shocking how big that was, and it just made everything look great. Food trucks there, drink vendors. Um, Cabela's came out, brought some boats. Uh, I mean, you know, it was just it was uh, it was cool to see a larger event in our area. We just we we've kind of been starved for that, and it feels like we have one now. Um, and hopefully, it just continues to grow year on and uh excited for next year but as far as the fishing goes if that's what you want to know about it it was as tough as i've ever seen it out there and i think everyone else that fished it would say the same um phil and clint kind of outsmarted everybody and weighed in some largemouth we all knew they were going to do that 
those guys are hammers in the river in Lake Cal. And uh, I think everybody was a little worried about them catching them in there because they're so consistent. Nobody's surprised they, they pulled it off. Um, but the big lake was just tough for all those reasons I mentioned earlier. Very clear. And the water was up to like 78 degrees, which you don't see much on Lake Michigan. It's about as warm as it gets. Maybe a couple degrees more. But fishing got tough. And But still a lot of great fish weighed in. There was five plus weighed in the first day. And, mm -hmm. and uh, quite a few four pluses coming yeah. in. So if we hit it right, there would be huge bags. Um, like I said, you said it was, it was a tough. great event. You said it was tough, yep. right? I mm -hmm. surveyed a dozen teams before the event happened. I'm looking at my phone here. I got it all recorded, right? Um, okay. You were the first person I asked. Do you remember what you thought it would take for two days, what you told me? I think I said 34 pounds. 35 pounds, okay. Okay. So okay. the closest guess, the lowest guess was 34 by Cody Bertrand. So we owe, we owe Cody something, you know, we got to send him a rod sock or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, everyone guessed, I'm looking here, everyone guessed between 34 and 42 pounds. So, I mean, the expectation was, you know, 16 to 20 pounds a day. And I thought somewhere around that 16 to 17 mark as well, you know, 20 this time of year seems almost impossible, but you know, well, late... for what, for one day, it's not impossible at all. It's, it's very, it's very doable. Normally for one day, not for two days, you know, sure. you know somebody caught 22 days in a row. That'd be incredible. Yeah. Um, but it's still, it's still out there. Those fish are out there. There's so many four plus pounders at this end of the lake. They're just, they're just tricky when that water gets warm and the water gets clear, but yeah, you're right. They were, everybody guessed that because that's what it typically would take. Yeah. And it was just happened to be, you know, a little bit of post spawn funk, post spawn blues, whatever you want to call it. And then just, you know, it was supposed to blow too. It was supposed to blow pretty hard and that would have made them bite better. It would have made it a little harder on the anglers, but um, that would have made them bite better. But pretty much, I mean, um, by my standards, that that was flat calm. It was, you know, there was a little bit of rolling yeah, around out there. But we were worried it about was flat calm and for wind. Days. Worried yep. about rain and wind. And, you know, day one was a little <laughs> breezy, but I mean, day it got better through the day. And then day two was really calm and sunny. Calm and blistering hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sweating, sweating terribly, sitting at the wind. Yeah. And, you know, if it was a spawn tournament, it would have blown 20 out of the east because we would have wanted the calm temperature yeah, right. the calm conditions. But um, we wanted a little wind and they didn't give it to us. So. Now, as uh, as an angler in the event, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everyone likes catching big fish. Everyone likes seeing big fish weighed in. Um, yep. Are you completely fine with it? Same week, same same time next year, or if there wasn't if there was an option, would you rather do it in the spring, early summer, or later fall? Because I know for a fact, in the spring and the fall, you would see twenty pound bags. Oh, absolutely. You would, you would need that to have a chance to compete in the spring and the fall for sure. Um, you need more than that, honestly. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I kind of like the way it's set up. Um, I, I wouldn't mind it being a little bit earlier, you know, <laughs> mid July, something like that. Um, late June, but I, I like the summer idea because it, it opens up the lake so much more. It, it makes it fish so much bigger. Guys aren't going to be crammed into, you know, three or four areas. Sure. Uh, you can you can catch a good fish anywhere within the boundary, uh, you know, from Wisconsin to Michigan. Uh, you could it could be one, honestly, anywhere. There's yeah. so many good spots in the summertime when those fish finally leave their spawning areas. And this is about the time that they're they're out there. There's offshore opportunity. There's you catch them shallow, you can catch them deep, you can go up the into the uh into the sag. Um, we had guys, you know, run all the way to Portage. Um, it just, it just fishes bigger. And it, I think it gives a lot of the guys that maybe don't have as much experience on the big lake, it gives them a chance to compete. Sure. And I, I like that. I like it being more of a dynamic tournament that way. Yeah. I yeah. think that there's something funny in an angler's brain, you know, cause I was over here, you know, working with the event, but I could have fished it and I was like, 
ah, uh, maybe, you know, but there's such hammers out there. And anytime there's a tough tournament, it's like, oh, I should have gotten that one. You know, you had a chance, maybe. Right. Yeah, you could have went, oh, it was 14 pounds, you know, it was like, yeah, I've done that. over I've 14, done 14 pounds a day. Cal, you know? Sure, yeah. And the cal has been taking, you know, a couple weeks ago, it was taking 16, 17 a day uh, to win some of the other tournaments. So um, even that was tough. It was just, yeah, it was just one of those tough weeks of fishing. Absolutely. That you come across in, you know, middle of summer or late summer, I guess we're calling it now. But um yeah, I think it I think it went off perfect. Um I'd love it if it wasn't 95 degrees, but sure. There's no guarantees that having it this time of year also um it doesn't eliminate the chance of having to cancel a day or cancel both days or postpone, but a lot better odds of having south, southwest, west winds sure. this time of year. Sure. Um so that we can get the tournament off and, and not uh, not have to cancel anything. So I'm all bored. Whatever they decide to do, it's you know it was basically on the the reasoning for having it this time was because it it lined up with the South Shore schedule and uh, and Horseshoe schedule, and there wasn't a lot of big stuff going on at the time. So sure, it lined up perfectly. Um, but yeah, if they, I mean, if it was my choice, yeah, let's have it in November. But right. good luck getting two days without uh, north winds. You know, or northeast winds where we have to cancel for a small or, craft. Or a crowd at the weigh-ins because it might be exactly. uh, 38 yeah. degrees and, you know, sleeting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But so, and another shout out to, you know, JP being the weighmaster and Pat Renwick as, as MC. They did a great job. Um, and then all the volunteers, you know, I didn't get to get all their names and shake all their hands. But there was a lot of people that just volunteered to help get fish back. There was volunteer release boats to get those fish back out into the lake. And uh, kudos to all those guys and Dennis for getting all those people together. It's uh, It was amazing to see um, around here because usually we're in a parking lot with a plastic table and a scale right. huddled around somebody's truck at a lot of our tournaments. So, yeah, good to see. From competitors that were in their 20s to competitors that were in their 60s, 70s, everyone said yep. it was one of the nicer tournaments they had fished, you know. Um, and especially to bring that to our area, you know, so before we move on from yeah. the tournament, if we have some anglers that fish, let's say the Sturgeon Bay open or some guys that are in the chain of lakes area or in, you know, um, a little further into Eastern Indiana, but they all once in a while fish our area. Uh, what's, what's yeah. your plea to them on why they should come fish the event next year? I mean, I feel like if you're a tournament angler and you're competitive and, uh, you want to fish for good money. Like, I, I don't know what else to say. It was a hundred percent payback. There was actually, it was more than a hundred percent. There was money yeah. added to the pot. Yep. Yep. Um, that right there as a tournament angler myself, you, you say that and it's within a couple hours of me, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, Cause it doesn't really exist. It's, it's very hard to find a hundred percent payback, let alone 110 or whatever it ended up being. Um, sure. And then, you know, the coverage of it, you know, we're doing the live, live weigh-ins. And then there's a photographer out. They had drones out flying around, taking photos of people. And if you're a competitive angler, that's that's what you want. You want coverage and you want a safe uh, and, and well-run tournament where you can actually make some real money. And they're not just taking all your money and paying it out across the board to other people that aren't even fishing the event. All your money's coming back to you. Um, the the meeting, you were at the meeting. They, they had, we had a, a meeting at Horseshoe Casino at a hospitality room afterward. Uh, a bar overlooking the lake, open bar for a couple hours, and uh, fully catered sandwiches. I took advantage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I ate like seven or eight of those pulled pork sandwiches. Like they're they were incredible. I didn't expect any of that. I mean, I expected to have to spend a few bucks at that thing, but they they rolled the red carpet out for us for this meeting. Free parking. They also waived all the uh, all the um, launch fees for the entire week for practice. Yep. at the harbor yeah, that's huge and that's i mean that's usually a 20 dollar launch fee so uh and offering up slips to us to rent um that's that's amazing too that's something we don't normally get no no overall great yeah, man. just come out and check it out you know I, just, I would just tell the guys to come come try it out and it's a it's a safe area it's a it's a gated marina with a you know million dollar boats in there it's not um, you know, I, I know a lot of people are might be afraid to come through Chicago. It's not in Chicago, it's in Indiana, but 
and you can fish in fish Chicago waters, which are great. But I can't say enough about it. Uh, one of the best tournaments I've ever fished. All right. So Ryan, besides being a tournament angler and you do fish quite a few tournaments, whether it's on Lake Michigan or the Cal, you know, um, what you guide out there, right? So you spend a lot of time out there in general. What is mm-hmm. some of the biggest changes or some of the things that have really stuck out to you over the last year or two on the South end? Well, in the last year or two, not much other than falling water, but I, I've been fishing it for 20 to like 21 years now. And, uh, it's, it's changed. It's changed, you know, the water level changes a lot. There's like a, seems like a five or 10 year cycle where it'll go up, you know, five, six foot swings in, in water level. It's not like a smaller lake, you know, a small lake, like you get a bunch of rain for a couple of weeks and it, it goes up and then right. it comes right back down. Lake Michigan doesn't do that. It's too big. It takes so long for it to rise. So it'll be a slow rise over five, six years, you know, maybe six inches to a foot a year. And then it goes way up. And we had that until I think it was about three years ago, it started falling again. But before that, we're at like almost an all time high. And then now it's back to about normal, I would say. And it's still falling. So so that's been a change, you know, fish are spawning in areas again now that you didn't really see them before um, just because of light penetration and everything. So kind of getting back to where it was about 10 years ago okay. right now. So people are having to adjust to that. Um, but yeah, in the, in the last 10, 15 years, fishing has just gotten really good. It's uh, There's definitely a larger population of fish, or at least it feels that way. I don't know if I don't know if it's that or us as anglers have just gotten better with the technology and the, sure. the electronics and the baits and everything being, a, you know, having more tools to catch them. But there's certainly more fish being caught on the south end of Lake Michigan. Uh, the weights, since I started fishing tournaments out there, the weights have gone up so much. You know, it, in the past, in the spring, you, you, you'd almost never even see 20 pounds. Every yeah. once in a while, you'd see 20. Now, every spring tournament, every fall tournament, and even some summer ones, you need 20 to 23 to even be thinking about getting a win most of the time. Yeah. Uh, if conditions are right, you know, obviously when it blows down here, uh, the wrong it's direction, crappy. it limits it and it, and weights go down a little bit. But uh, when conditions are right, it takes over a four pound average. Uh, I would say other than, other than July, August, September, those are the months that maybe the weights go down a little bit, but all those other months that it's fishable. And I'm talking about like, you know, March, like early March, you can get out there and catch fish like that and all the way into December. Last year we were catching them around Christmas yeah, uh, and even after a little bit. So it's a long season. The lake doesn't, the lake hasn't been freezing the last couple of years and that's why the water's dropping. But as far as changes, yeah, like less ale wives, not seeing as many ale wives. Um, Gobies have gotten smaller. I think, I don't know what that's about. I think it's probably because uh, brown trout and lake trout are eating a lot of the gobies now too. So they're getting thinned out. Still a lot of gobies. They're just not as big as we used to see 10, 15 years ago. Um, The bait seems to come in cycles. Like one fall, one year it'll be all shad and it'll be all gizzard shad. And then the next year it's alewives or emerald shiners. um, A lot of emeralds. Even too. A lot of emerald emerald shiners. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's helping the fishery a lot too. Um, Yeah. Those smallmouth love eating those things late in the year and early in the year. So, Uh, but it, you know, it changes. It seems like it changes yearly so much that it's hard to say what's changed over the years, but um, you just, that's what makes it so fun. I would have left Chicago a long time ago if it wasn't for Lake Michigan, because it's just such a dynamic fishery and it, it, I'm still finding new things out there every year, almost every month. Yeah. I find something new and yeah. it seems endless. It's so much water and it's so limited to the time I can get out there because of the conditions. So yeah, uh, just a great lake and it's getting better. Yeah. You know, Ryan, for the last year I've been, well, almost two years now, I've been trying to push the agenda that Chicago is a fishing city. And I use those words, Chicago is a fishing city. And I, have I love people, it. 
I have to be very honest, you know, um, a lot of that thought process started when I realized what you and JP were doing in the Chicago river years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, I still don't know exactly what you guys were doing out there, but you guys were catching fish in the Chicago river more than, you know, people at least made it visible to the naked right. eye. Um, right. And that made me start looking around more, you know, and then, um, you know, before you know it, I realized there's some nice fish here, but, you know, not just outside the locks, you know, inside and um, yeah. all the way down into the Cal Sag. And obviously, you and I, you know, growing up here, the pond fishing in Chicago land, whether you have to maybe trespass once in a while or not, it is it is truly some of the best pond fishing yeah. outside of Florida in the world. Yep. Yep. That's what I always say. It rivals Florida. I mean, we don't have as many ponds, but it, it's like Florida. It, it's I've gone to Florida and gone pond pond hopping, and I, I've done it here. You know, the whole all the western suburbs, uh, incredible fishing. Like, and, and I think you're right. It is, it is somewhat of a fishing city. City. I mean, there's there's a there's a long tradition of fishing in Chicago. You know, you can go all the way back to the the smelt fishing days. Um, you know, not really any smelt left in the lake, but um, that was a big deal. And then the perch fishing is still big. And obviously the coho run in the spring, um, you know, lake trout has become a thing that you can do from shore now in the winter. Oh yeah. Um, and that's incredibly fun, you know, and, and there's so many of them. It's, it's, uh, it's really a good time that, you know, you want to catch a big fish. It's like, they're all, they're all pretty big, uh, this, and yeah. not this incredibly like hard to catch. So. We had a PSA last fall, and I'll say it now, and I'm sure we'll say it in a couple of months again. If you guys mm -hmm. want to catch a big, fun, fighting fish, go yeah. down to Navy Pier or some of the other harbor walls and just vertical jig some hair jigs or a five-inch fluke or, you know, a, a jigging spoon and catch some of these yeah. lakes. And like you said, it's not like there's no, like, like there's, you know, you go out in the mountains and you catch a lot of lakers that are – three pounds, five pounds, eight pounds. It's like every Laker's over 12 pounds. Well, I did, yeah, I mean, a little less than that, but yeah, I mean, eight, six, six, seven, eight pounds seems to be about the average and all the way up to, I don't know. I mean, I don't weigh them very often, but I know we're over 15. And yeah, we got a 16 sometimes. last year. That yeah. was our biggest one, a 16. Um, yep, yep. And there's and a that, lot of those. And that being yeah. said, I believe it's only time um, I think we got to thin the herd a little bit. That's why this PSA is here. Um, you know, if we can reduce the numbers of them, I think we could see some of those like Canadian giants start growing down here, yeah. like the 30, 40, 50 pounders, because the foods there, there's just so many of them that I think we need to, yeah. you know, thin them. So, hey, if you guys want to keep them, I highly recommend doing that too and smoke them. That is the best way to keep them. I would take the smaller ones though. If you're, if you're going to keep them, keep those smaller ones. Um, yeah. you know, those, those five, six, seven pounders, that's, that's what you want to eat. Nice. I wouldn't be keeping those 15 pluses there. I don't think they're going to taste great. And that's, um, that's a big fish lays a lot of eggs. So, absolutely. Um, but yeah, lots of tons of fishing opportunity in Chicago. There's always a bite. It's never dead. I mean, you can fish in the dead of winter. There's a bite somewhere, somewhere, uh, whether it's from shore or if you can get a boat out, a lot of industrial rivers, tributaries of Lake Michigan that just don't freeze whether it's because of, you know, pollution or discharges or whatever it is. There's yeah. so many fish in these rivers that, uh, you know, there's always somewhere to go. And, and, and buy. I sold, I sold all my ice fishing gear last year because I'm just, I'm, I would much rather open water fish and there's opportunity. Yeah. So, you know, and ice fishing has become pretty hard to do around here lately <laughs> because of the mild winters. It so has. I'll probably it's, jinx it. We'll probably have a gnarly winter this year because of it. But hey, I'm I'm praying as someone who loves ice fishing, you know. But no, yeah. it's true. Last year, last year there was only I believe two weeks where we felt like we really couldn't get the boat out, and we probably could have if we brought some salt and some, you know, some sledgehammers to the ramp. But um, yeah. 
almost a whole year on the South end where it was open, you know, and I only had to drive two, three hours for safe ice. And although it was a sketchy year, you know, it was nice to have that, you know, option to, if I wanted to go up North, I could go ice fish, but down here, keep the boat open. Um, if you have a heated garage or heated storage, you really don't have to winterize the boat anymore. If you're going to utilize no. it. Um, yep. And that's, and that's amazing. Um, before we run out of time here, Ryan, I do want to talk about, the fact that speaking of all the time you spent out there and seeing the differences is at some point along that journey, you decided you were going to make a bait. And this is a non-sponsored plug here, but Ryan, mm -hmm. you, you create a bait that I have to be honest, um, you know, maybe one or two have been free in my life, but I pay for those things and I'll throw them and I'll fish them my whole life because they are truly better in certain, certain situations uh, than most other baits and it's a little finesse jig so tell me about your little your little firework i appreciate it jim and 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 yeah i think that's how we met was at a sports show when we were we were there selling some jigs long time ago um mm -hmm. yeah jp jp high and i started tightrope fishing in 2012 i think 2012 2013 was our first year and all it was was uh yeah we were just shore fishermen at the time um i had gotten a boat but we we fished from shore so much in the spring because it was so accessible and uh we got snagged a lot lost a lot of baits and so i was just always tinkering i'm always looking for something you know something to tinker with to to improve a bait and uh i, I was just taking this little ball head and started tying skirts onto it in kind of a unique way i didn't know that it was unique at the time i was just just a means to an end it was just i was just trying to get this skirt on this ball head because i didn't want to buy other jig heads i already had all these so um so yeah we started tying this jig and turned out it it came through the rocks really well didn't hang up much and it caught them good uh you know before this jig we were losing like we'd go fishing for a day we'd lose like 15 or 20 jigs so almost like, couldn't well, afford going fishing box. <laughs> exactly and these weren't like these jigs were throwing they weren't like i'm not talking about just a jig head and a right and a plastic i'm talking about a tied a hand tied skirt jig and you know five six dollar jigs six bucks yeah five six bucks and losing like 10 or 15 of them a day it was ridiculous so uh, i made this thing gave some to jp we you know talked about a week later and he's like dude i, I'm, I still got the same one tied on that i tied on and i fished every day and i caught the hell out of them so um that was really exciting and then we just we were just fishing them we started fishing local tournaments together and doing pretty well throwing those jigs. And uh, it turned out to be a thing. People started asking for them. We were both broke, completely broke, just trying to get money to fish. So decided Shock to start selling them. And by the way, shocker, yeah, what's up? fisherman's broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shocker. Yep. It's, yeah, total shocker. Um, but it was... Uh, it was something that we just we, we started doing just kind of selling them on facebook and ended up building a website and then it kind of took off hooked up with catch co a couple of years ago and got a licensing deal with them um that's no longer going but uh you know we've kind of taken over the production of it and uh still available tightropefishing.com if anyone wants to check out any of the products that's where they're all at we've got a spinner bait out now too kind of uh we kind of focus on finesse style baits so we've got a finesse spinner bait and uh and a couple of finesse jigs we've got several different sizes of it and it's something that works you know it's not just a great lakes bait it's not just a small mouth bait it's something that works great for large mouth spotted bass all over the country um you know i've traveled all over fishing tournaments and that jig is always tied on and got a lot of buddies that do the same thing and we're always shooting out jigs people that are traveling fishing tournaments so it's been something that's been great for us and uh just to kind of keep us on the water yeah and uh help us put fish in the boat so i know that i've caught my biggest lake um well biggest illinois lake michigan smallmouth on it and i also mm -hmm. won my first check in when i lived in alabama on it nice, nice. um and the spotted bass yep yep spotted bass yeah. um to be fair my biggest two came on a little m a little john md crankbait but my other mm -hmm. th my other three came on the tight ropes so yeah yeah it's just little it's a you know, it's a small compact jig that fish eat little crawfish we actually designed the bait to imitate gobies 
when you put a straight tail trailer on it, it it's, it's supposed to look like a goby. Yeah. Uh, when you're throwing it where gobies are around, but you put a craw trailer on there, it's a great craw imitator. So yeah, it's uh, been something we're really into. And the spinner bait has been uh, no less successful for us either. It's it's really kind of taken off. Just finesse, compact spinner bait, uh, small blades. It's it's called the bite getter. That was the only name I could think of because that's what I always called this one that I was always making for myself. It, it was my it was my bite getter. I needed a keeper in a tournament. I tied that on. So, um, yep. Yeah, and we appreciate your support too. I mean, we you know, you and I have been seeing each other at sports shows for what over 10 years now for least, sure yeah for and, sure uh, and yeah you've always you've always helped us out and we appreciate that um keep the money in the family keep it in the neighborhood you know um yeah. south, south yep. side is for life i mean a lot of people won't even know what that really means you know but there's um there's there's yeah. legit culture that goes here you know in the south i'm end. a transplanted south sider now but uh I've I've been here long enough now. I see it's a it's it's pretty tight knit and the fishing scene, everyone I've met down here in the in the bass fishing scene and just the fishing scene in general has been awesome. And um, you know, I honestly these weekend tournaments locally, the CSBA tournaments, Angler's Choice, whatever it is, uh, it's such a blast. Yeah. Everybody hangs out after the tournament and you know, has a drink or whatever and and everybody's comparing notes on what they're catching it's just a, uh, it's it's very competitive and there's a lot of really great fishermen in the area but it's got the feel of a small club you know even though we're fishing for pretty good money it's it's a it's a really cool thing that i haven't seen at a lot of other places i'll i'll mention that before we go because I, i'm and i'm glad you said that because you know I, i'll be very honest this is the first time i've really talked about this and on a media platform but mm -hmm. I don't fish much tournaments anymore because I thought it got really ugly and really annoying um, with how competition was, how competitors competitors treated each other. I mean, listen, I get it, right? You don't have to be best friends. You are competing against each other. You're trying to take the guy next yeah. to your money. You know, the last two events I've been to around here, you know, uh, one Cal SAG event and, and this South Shore Bass Open, um, yeah. it's not like you're going into Mary Poppins land where everyone's, you know, like hugging each other, you know, but there yeah. is camaraderie and you don't have the BS, you know, there there wasn't hate, you know, um, I know for a couple of people, it was tough to just miss out on a check or miss out on first for you, you know, but there's still handshakes for the winners, you know, everyone kind of, like you said, stuck around, you know, a lot weren't ready to just leave and it's, um, it's good for the sport. Yeah. It's good for the sport. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and I couldn't have been happier to see, uh, Phil and Clint win that thing. Those guys are, they're such great guys. And, you know, most tournaments were the last ones at the, in, in the parking lot after the tournament, you know, last ones to leave or boats are still in the water, you know, three hours after the event, because we're just talking and, you know, comparing uh stories throughout the day so i mean that's what it's really all about you know anyone can you you can just go out and fish and enjoy yourself and go catch some fish and that's great and we all do that too but um to have the camaraderie of all these guys and, and great guys you know if it, if anyone if anyone has something break on their boat or whatever there's always somebody to come and help uh and it's and it's never the same guy so um it's uh it's just a really cool thing to see and i i wish i wish more scenes are like that maybe there i'm sure there are i'm sure there's good scenes across the country like that um but uh i just all i can speak on is this one and i think it's awesome yeah you know i know the christie's boat wasn't acting right and um two teams including one that was in the top in the running to yep. win this went over to their house or wherever to go help them try to fix their boat so that they could compete as well you know i mean oh yeah you yep. don't hear that that often Nope. Nope. Not when, not when we're all competing for a pretty high dollar amount, you know, guys are going to want to be rigging and, and not take the time. But, uh, I think everybody that's fished tournaments long enough knows that you're going to have some trouble eventually and, and you're going to need help. And, and, you know, that's why everybody's going out of their way to help everybody because they, they've all had it happen and, uh, and, and probably had the help from everybody else. So.
Yeah, so hey, shout through. out to you know the Yamaha or the Mercury um, you know service pit crew. If you guys want to come down and set up a trailer at the uh, South Shore Bass event next year, I'm sure we have yep. a lower unit or an engine you can work on. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Especially if it gets rough, yeah, stuff's gonna break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So absolutely. Ryan, before we let you go, um, obviously, thank you. And, you know, uh, wish you continued success here forward. Um, if someone does want to book you as a guide or wants to learn out there, first, I want you to give one nibble of something right now. Like, give us, if you were going out what tomorrow, what, you know, what are you going to have tied on? What are you going to have some of your people throwing and kind of, you know, where roughly, how deep maybe? And uh, then, give us your contact, you know? So if people want to see yep. it instead of just hear it, you know, how can they do that? I'll just give you a general tip of something that I, you know, through having clients in my boat, a mistake I see from, I mean, probably 90% of people that sip in my boat, not even just clients, like other tournament fishermen too, I fish with. Um, keep your bait on the bottom. Like, you're, that lake is deep. Most of the most of the bait, uh, most of the spots you're fishing out there, are you know at least ten foot deep, you know, and that would be uh, we call that fishing shallow. Yep. On Lake Michigan, that's shallow. So you know, 15, 20, 25, 30, whatever. Um, gobies are the main for. I don't care what's around. I don't care if the emerald shiners are around and they're five foot up or the shatter in or whatever. Gobies are still the main forage out there and also a lot more crawfish than people understand in that lake. Um, so when you go to, when you fish inland lakes, we call them, I know it's an inland lake, it's not an ocean, but it's kind of an ocean. Uh, but this lake with all the gobies in there, if you're fishing another lake, you fish a jig or a tube or anything like that, you usually got your rod tip up and you're hopping, snapping yep. it up off the bottom. That most of the time that's not the move. You want to keep your rod tip down and basically point your rod tip at the water. And then you're just keeping your bait on the bottom and you're moving it side to side with little scoot motions, mm -hmm. not dragging, but actually scooting the bait. Cause those, those gobies, when they move, they call them darters for a reason. They dart, they go, yep. boop, 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 boop. they just, they scoot across the bottom and they never leave the bottom. Goby can't leave the bottom. They don't have a swim bladder. They have to stay on the bottom. So, uh, that's the biggest tip I could give that will help that I think would help someone catch fish throughout the year out there. If you're throwing a bottom bait, make sure you're not hopping it real high off the bottom. Keep it down there. As far as right now, we're throwing tubes, we're throwing jigs, we're throwing a drop shot. Uh, and then certain areas, certain areas in the rocks where they're getting up there, throwing a spinner bait, chartreuse, chartreuse and white, white, white chartreuse, whatever combination you want to try, as long as it's those two colors. Um, throw that thing up in the rocks and and going fast with that and then a crankbait too, even a medium diving crankbait around the rocks. Those would be the two kind of patterns we're doing right now. Uh, look for current, find any current you can find. There'll be fish there. Points, harbor mouths, the wind's blowing down some rocks, any kind of current. Doesn't matter if it's natural, man-made or whatever. That's what you're looking for in the summer. Um, and as far as where to find me, chicagobassfishing.com is my website um, but the easiest way just message me on facebook message me on instagram email me um, all my information is on chicagobassfishing.com so just hit me up like i say we you know the weather's iffy to book trips you know if we get a north wind we get a small craft advisory we just can't go it's too dangerous so um you can call me i'll talk about what the weather's looking like and we can figure out a day we book a day in advance and it blows, we'll reschedule it. No problem. Um, I'm not taking deposits for that re reason. So we'll just book a tentative day. And then uh, as it gets closer, we check in and make sure the weather's good. And then hopefully we go. But yeah, just contact me direct. And, uh, and I will say that this year is kind of the first year I've gone like full time guiding. I've, I've done it a little bit in the past. Um, but all the clients are having a blast and they're, most people are shocked at what's out there. I get a lot of guys that live really close and they never fished out there and they go out there and have a good day. And they're like, Oh my God, I can't believe we've lived here 30, 40 years and didn't know this was here. So, uh, it's an incredible fishery and 
I'm just happy to be able to share it with people. Absolutely. Well, hey, and it's, uh, I don't think there's anything more rewarding than seeing someone catch their first fish or their biggest fish or, you know, it's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm doing it. It's so fun. Yeah. Well, hey, Ryan, thanks for joining us, uh, truly, and good luck for the rest of the year, and hopefully we can get on the water soon. Absolutely, and Jim, thank you uh, for all the support, and and congratulations on all the success, too, with Midwest Outdoors. Like, I know you've been hustling for a long time, and it's good to see, uh, you know, you doing doing a podcast, traveling around to tournaments, and representing Midwest Outdoors. Good stuff. Big fan of Midwest Outdoors, too. Yes, absolutely. Appreciate it, Ryan. Truly means a lot. Um, yeah. Well, get out of the water. Go get those rods rigged up and we will talk to you later. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, everyone. That is Ryan Whitaker, jig maker, professional guide, tournament fisherman and South Cider through and through. Um, Ryan, again, I'm sorry you couldn't get it done. You and your partner, you know. The money, my money was on you. I went into the horseshoe. I went into the horseshoe the night before the tournament and I was going to put all my money in Ryan Whitaker, but I guess they don't have gambling for the South Shore Bass Open in Horseshoe. But um, shout out to everyone at Horseshoe for being one of the title sponsors for the event. You guys put together an absolute great event between the South Shore Tourism and the Horseshoe Casino. So thanks guys for making it awesome. We're going to take one more commercial break, but Come on back and join us because we're going to look at something funky and kind of cool that we saw at ICAST this year. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. All right, welcome back everyone. Hey, this is normally when we do our product review. And I gotta be honest, I haven't thrown any of these baits yet, so it's not quite a review. But this was something at ICAST that was different than anything else I saw, and frankly, have I ever seen in the fishing industry. So we're gonna go over four different baits from Handing Lure Company. Um, I believe they're out of China. They have partnered with Mustad. They got Mustad hooks on here, and I'll tell you what, I don't know how they fish yet, but the design process, the thought behind this, it's it's all pretty incredible. Um, now, do they catch fish and do they swim great? That's the big question, and maybe we'll be able to answer that down the line, but without further ado, let's get into it. I guess we'll go smallest to largest. All right, our first one here is the rattle trap. Um, you know, you can see there's a uh, metal attachment point there. It's a little different than most baits. Uh, its size is definitely a little more compact. It feels like a half ounce bait, but it's the size of a quarter ounce bait. You'll see that there is a common occurrence here with these baits. You have your predatory fish and your scared little bait fish, all right? And although they're the same size, one's eating the other. So that's a cool little one. That's the trap, you know, give it a sound. All right, you know, some high-pitched little BBs in there. So that's bait number one. Bait number two, the swim bait. Look at this, all right? Um, again, we got front attachment point here, uh, multi-jointed bait here. Looks pretty good. This one's got blue eyes. That's, you know, the difference I see right away. So like, it looks like a striper is the predatory fish. Um, so yeah, little inline hard-baited jointed swim bait. Number three, all right? The colors are getting a little crazier. We've got what looks like a dark Florida largemouth, you know, um, eating, a, eating a shad. This is a crankbait, you know, looks like a medium to shallow diving crankbait, maybe five, six foot here. Um, again, it's jointed. 
Another different thing to point about this one is you have some contrast in colors here, right? You have the light head of the bait fish and the darker predatory fish. So not sure how that'll work, but who knows? Maybe it'll stick out more like a bait fish really is getting chased. And then without further ado, this is really, this this takes the cake, all right? This is, this is the grand finale, all right? We have a, um, you know, I don't even I don't even know what the word for this whopper plopper tail is here. You know, you've got hinged joints on it. Um, again, I don't really know the reason. Maybe it will, if it's back weight, back weighted, it will fly through the air better, and these will close, so less uh, air resistance, I guess. Um, again, don't know, haven't thrown it yet, but yeah, collapsible paddles there, um, like a whopper plopper, and then obviously, guys, look at this. You got an alligator with its teeth chomping on a bluegill. Um, some really nice, actually, big hooks here um, and split rings. Looks nice. Can't wait to see if it catches a fish. Well, that is a wrap on all the handing lures. Truly a unique find and um, something everyone enjoyed at ICAST, whether you liked it or thought it was on the lower end of products, but intrigued to see how they work. Hey guys, as always, I want to say thank you for joining us here. This show's here every other week, so come and join us. Make sure to subscribe. If you're listening to this podcast right now, make sure you check out our video podcast on YouTube at Midwest Outdoors TV and subscribe over there too. I promise you'll learn some things and see some big fish catches or maybe hunting. And if that's what you're into, you'll certainly enjoy some upcoming shows because we will be getting into hunting season as it is coming. Well, I want to thank everyone that put together this show this week. I want to thank our guests and always thank our title sponsor for making this happen, Fish Daddy. I'm Jim O'Neill, everyone, and have a good week in tight lines. We'll see you next time.